Hey guys, Cliff Gray with Flat Tops Wilderness Guides and True Hunts. Today we're going to go over packing gear uh, in panniers and on mules and horses for packing wilderness hunts. And this is going to specifically apply to our hunts at Flat Tops Wilderness Guides, our drop camp and our pack-in guided hunts. And all the specifics will apply perfectly in those scenarios. But just so you guys know, this should be very helpful for you on other types of pack-in hunts uh, up in Canada and in the US, but just realize there might be some small modifications that in the style that your outfitter uses. So you can use this to kind of help you. The general rules are gonna apply about bulk and weight and those sort of things, and those tips and tricks will be useful, but some of the specifics you have to work with your outfitter on. But for us, we're gonna go through it meticulous so you're set up, and then when you get here, everything will go a lot smoother because you'll kind of have the right expectations of how the process works. All right guys, so the first thing I'm gonna talk about is what you can actually carry on your horse with you, all right? These, these, all the saddles that we use on our riding horses, they're gonna have basic uh, saddle bags on them. And what we tell guys is the theme on them is minimal, right? So really like uh, your water, um, some snacks for the ride. You know, a lot of guys are gonna to wanna to take their phone, oh uh, yeah, here for pictures or whatever. So, you know, this would be kind of your typical setup for a saddle bag and then also your rain gear. Um, what we find is even if it's a clear day, guys, just make sure that you have your rain gear, rain gear accessible. Not, you know, packing your, your rain gear into a pannier is, is the Colorado rain dance. If you do that, it's almost certainly going to rain at some point during your trip. So water, uh, phone to take pictures or, or a camera, um, some, you know, little snacks, that sort of thing, and then rain gear. Those are really what you need to have in those saddlebags. All right, and then what we're gonna do is we'll try to uh, even them up. So you don't wanna put it all on one side. Uh, it seems, it doesn't seem like it would affect the ride, but after a two or three hour ride, it can affect how that, how that saddle is, uh, is uh, riding on your horse, okay? So we'll even that up a little bit. And then just another thing that helps a lot when we're packing is these little items that you wanna have access to on the ride. If you can, it's very helpful if be, even before you show up, you have them bagged separately from your other gear. It can help us a lot when we're packing. What happens a lot of time is people get here, they're excited, we get their gear unloaded, right? And we're, we're making introductions and, and doing a little bullshitting. And what happens is like their water bottle or camera or something else they want with, want with them, like their rain gear, it'll end up in a bag that's getting packed, right? You know, while we're, while we're talking. And then as we get uh, where we're wanting to get on the horses, we've got to go back and dig through the panniers. And you'll see uh, when, I go, when we go through how we actually do the packing, it can be a little bit of a pain in the ass because now we've got to reweigh panniers. So if you could keep this stuff separate in a little bag and, and we'll, we'll set it to the, to the side whenever you show up, that's perfect and ideal. So when you guys show up, if you, if you do pack your water bottle, that's fine. We always have you know, just your normal type of disposable water bottles in the pack station. Um, just remind us and we'll get a couple out for you. They tend to be handy in the saddlebags because if we do um, have a bunch of gear on one side, we can balance them out with one of these small water bottles. And you can always, you can always drink them in camp if you don't drink them on the ride. Um, and the other thing that I didn't, I didn't mention you know, particularly in the later, the later hunts, like in October and early November, in addition to these, these four items, you might want to bring another layer, right? And I, the reason that hit me in my mind is because that tends to be one thing that ends up deep in packs is just, a, just another light layer to add uh, while you're riding. As, as you go up in elevation, it can cool down a lot, okay? So that's the basic saddlebag overview. Ready. Fella, we're going to camp with a pack train, not a freight train. Well, we've got a few things we might not be taking along. What like, about my cooler? What's yeah. wrong with it? I'm going to kill one hell of a big elk. I got to have a big cooler. Your cooler's ah. got to fit in this bag. Too big. How about my rod? It's too long. How about my target, Sam? Can we pack that just on the top of the, on the, <laughs> just on the top of the mule? Guess not. 
All right, guys, so the first thing I'm going to talk about is coolers, and almost all of our groups are going to bring coolers, all of our drop camp groups. And uh, we're going to get into another video with the actual details of perfecting how you pack food in them uh, and all of that. But for now, I'm going to hit on a few things that are related to just overall planning with them. Here I've got a Yeti. This is a 45 quart Yeti, and this is a Rubbermaid 40, 48 uh, quart uh, cooler. And <clears throat> both of these fit fine. The Yeti is the maximum size that'll fit in our, our bigger panniers. So this is the, the largest Yeti that you can bring. It's a, four, it's a 45 quart, as I mentioned. And the dimensions on this are 26 inches in terms of length and then 16 by 16, okay? So that's the maximum. You know, one, one thing I'll tell you guys, like as you look at them, one thing, the Yetis are obviously more expensive, and I understand if you have them, um, and they do, they do keep, keep things frozen longer, but you can see that for the size and weight and the bulk and all that's gonna factor in into the, the, gear, the gear weight limit that you have, you're gonna see that the Yeti, due to the, the size of the insulation, you don't, you don't get near as much space um, for the same size, right? And it's substantially heavier. So it's just something for you to think about. Uh, these, these cheaper coolers are fine. And if you're careful about how you use them up there, even in September, I think you'll find that, that food stays frozen in them uh, and cool just with, without a problem. And then the one thing I'll talk about uh, in this video on the coolers is try to limit how your, the fluid you put in there, right? You don't, it, you're a lot better off having frozen food, not ice. Um, the, the, the ice is going to melt and it tends to be a mess. And then the other thing is don't, don't put a bunch of fluids in here that adds up in terms of weight, like stacks of Gatorade, stuff like that. You can buy Gatorade powder. All the camps have good access to water. So don't use up your weight and bulk in these coolers with, with uh, fluids if you can avoid it and ice. Another thing um, for you guys to understand is that it helps us a lot, particularly in larger drop camp groups, if you bring coolers that are pre-packed relatively close in weight. Because what we're going to do is we're going to put, we, we try to make essentially cooler mules, right? So that mule's got two coolers on it. That's ideal. If we can avoid it, we don't like to have a cooler on one side and then soft gear on the, on the other side. It's really hard to match up. Uh, just the, the center of gravity on those type of loads. So ideally, if you bring two coolers that are the same, that, you know, similar or the same size and weight, that's perfect for us and, and ideal, all right? So that covers, covers uh, what we're looking for on coolers. All right, guys, so I think it's gonna help you to understand how this whole cooler thing works by us showing you actually how they, how they get thrown into panniers. So me and Jimmy are gonna show you that real quick. So first with the Yeti, you're going to see this take serious finesse when you're maxing this out. Coolers should maximum be around the 55 you know, pound range. A 60 pound cooler is, is, is max max. If you're lower than that, it's not a big deal uh, because what we can do is we can pack additional gear on the top here. And it's, uh, it's actually uh, a, a pretty good platform for putting extra gear on like this. So we do that quite often. So don't worry if your coolers are a little light, uh, that's better than them being a little bit heavy. Coolers are one of the hardest things to deal with if they're overweight. I'm gonna give you some tips on how to actually pack your gear where it makes the whole process a little bit simpler, okay? So a lot of times people are traveling with bags like this. You know, one large, heavy, uh, and bulky bag. And I can understand why guys, why guys travel that way on airplanes and stuff. It's a lot nicer just to have your gear all together. But just keep in mind, you know, if you've got a 70, 80 pound uh, bag like this, we can't pack it on the mules like this. So it's fine if you bring it to the pack station and it's all, all packed up like this, if you've got um, some modular packs inside, right? So what I like to see is if guys have dry bags, you don't have to have these heavy duty dry bags. You can use the little ultralight dry bags or even just garbage bags is, is, is another solution. But if you have little things that are compartmentalized in there, we can take it out and throw it in the pile. And then when we're packing the panniers, we can even up those panniers with the weight. We can't do that if you've got one pack that's 90 pounds, you know, and then you've got things in there that are only the small things are buried. Um, and so we end up kind of pulling all your gear out, right? And <clears throat> we, we know that can be annoying to you guys. And it's, uh, and it's a little bit of a pain in the ass on our side. So ideally, just have some little compartmentalized bags and it'll work out, it'll work out a whole lot better. And so like these dry bags are great. 
you know, little hunting packs like this are fine. So the other topic that's related to that is guys, a lot of times guys bring nice hunting packs and they're full of a bunch of gear, okay? So what my suggestion is, is it's okay to have some gear inside your hunting pack, but kind of have it set up with your day hunting gear in there. Cause I can understand, you know, you're at home, you want to have that all set up. So once you get into the mountains, you can just throw it on and start hunting. <coughs> so you can have all that day hunting gear in there, but really, you know, in our drop camps, um, you, that, that should only equate to, you know, like a, like a 15, 20 pound pack at maximum. So you shouldn't have a real big bulky pack um, that you're just going to use for day hunting. But some guys, what they'll do is they'll have their, their hunting gear in there and then they add a bunch of other gear. So, so their backpacks, they end up being 60, 70 pounds. And we hate, again, we hate to have to go through your stuff and pull things out. So just have them tidy like this. Like this pack is just perfect, right? This is probably about what you're gonna day hunt with from, from the drop camp. So why not just have it like that? It's, it's easy for us to pack like that, okay? And then you can, of course, just have them empty too. That's always an option. If you wanna wait until you get up, up to camp to organize what you have in your pack, that's perfectly fine. But if you can do us a favor, just uh, try not to bring your pack totally full um, so we don't have to go through your stuff and, and, and mess with the weight that way. Another little tip, guys, that helps us a little bit, and, and I think it'll help you also, and that's your boots, your boots and shoes. So if you've got some camp shoes like Crocs or tennis shoes, and then you've got your hiking boots, and let's say you're wearing something uh, else on the horse, th that footwear can just be left loose, okay? So you don't have to bury it down in your pack. You know, nobody's got clean hunting boots, so that's kind of the last thing you want to do anyways is put your boots down in with your clothing. Um, so leave them separate. Just make sure they end up in the pile that's going to get packed on the mules, and we'll use these to ballast loads. They're perfect. You know, if we're, we're off by a pound and a half, two pounds, we can grab one of your boots and put it in one side of a pannier, and it works, works well for us. The, and another thing to mention is we can do that with water bottles. So if, if you've got a water bottle or, or we're, we're giving you a small disposable water bottle for the ride and that's in your saddlebag and you're packing water bottles or camelbacks or something like that, again, you can keep them separate. They're a little bit of weight, but what we ask you to do is don't have them fully loaded. Like a Nalgene bottle, it's not as, not as big a deal, um, but like a big camelback, you know, you can have a 10 pound, 10 pound camelback when it's full of water and it doesn't make a lot of sense for us to pack that up for you when we're going to put you in a camp that's, you know, that's 100, 100 or 200 feet from a, from a perfectly good spring, okay? So it's fine to have them separate. Again, they're small items we can ballast loads with, but if you can, try not to have particularly camelbacks fully loaded with water so we're packing up something that's already up there for you. All right, guys, so uh, th we're going to show you how this all plays out in terms of actually packing the panniers to put on the, the mule, and Jimmy's going to help me on that. One thing I'll mention, and this is kind of more applies to the guys, the guys that are probably uh, watching this because they're just curious about packing. One of the keys, key deals with packing is having the weight uh, correct on each side. So up in the camps, you'll see that we use little hand scales, and then down here in the barn, we've got these scales hanging from the roof. Um, and it seems, it seems kind of anal to people, but to be honest with you, 90% of packing is just making sure each side weighs the same, okay? So you'll see us use those scales as we pack up uh, gear a lot. So anyways, Jimmy's going to join me and I'll, we'll show you that, how this kind of works. Usually we're going to grab the, the bulkier items and we'll start to even up the, the panniers with those. And we're trying to match weight, but we're also trying to match bulk. So you'll see that we're trying to put the same type of gear on each side if we can. So usually about when we get the, we get the packs, let's say, you know, 50, 60, 70% packed, we're going to snug them up a little bit. and start matching our weight. So you'll see once we have them pretty close, <clears throat> we can use our last couple, pa a couple bags. To even them up. At this point, we'll usually give them one last little weigh-in. 
If uh, we're super lucky, they'll be perfect, but usually at this point, this is where we're gonna use boots, water bottles, small items to ballast the load. So you'll see us just snugging in uh, boots like this. The final thing we'll do once we have them weighed perfectly, we'll snug them up with the cross straps. And then you're gonna see the, the loads like this, at this point they're gonna disappear and they're gonna go behind the mule that they get packed on. And you guys will see, um, I'll mention it because you might be interested, is we know each mule, we know how old they are, they know, we, and we kind of, we try to put light loads on certain mules, heavy loads on, on other mules, so that's why you'll see your gear is kind of, it's not a haphazard way we set it out there. We're usually putting a certain weight load uh, to a certain mule, um, and that kind of fits the criteria that we're looking for for that specific st uh, pack animal. So the next thing I'm gonna talk about, guys, is top packs. And usually what we're talking about um, in terms of gear, when we're talking about top packs for drop camp hunters and guided hunters in wilderness camps, we're talking about sleeping bags and then sometimes chairs, okay? Um, but generally when we're talking about sleeping bags and bed rolls, the, uh, the, key, the key deal is that they can't be really heavy. And this is, this is maximum on bulk. All right, this is, this, this is my personal one. I'd consider it on the, on the bulky end of things, but it's fine because it's not that heavy and it's really compressible, right? So when we pack this on top of a mule, you know, this is the perfect, perfect length in the sense that we can, we can, put, we can put our knot where it, it, it sits right on the top of this uh, top pack and snugs it down there. And just the, because it's soft, it's gonna help us uh, snug that down. Sometimes you're gonna see us pack harder items like chairs um, and it's, it's, it's a little bit more difficult for us to do that. And the result is that it's not, we don't do a whole lot of them, right? Like it might be one small chair, maybe two chairs, right? That's the maximum we can do when you've got chairs as a top pack just because they're, they're hard as a structure. So we can't snug them down there and get them real tight on the load. But sleeping bags are perfect, bed rolls are perfect. You know, if you look at this, like a lot of the sleeping bags that you, you know, the inexpensive ones that are perfectly fine for, for drop camps, they're like half the size of this, uh, this bed roll, you know, bulky, inexpensive sleeping bags. Those are perfect. We can deal with those as top packs uh, just fine. Sometimes if we've got room in the panniers, we'll put them in there. Um, but a lot of times you'll see us kind of setting them, setting them to the side. And that's because when we start putting the panniers on the mules, we're gonna throw those sleeping bags on top and snug them down with the rope. And those are gonna be our top packs. All right, guys, so the next thing we're gonna talk about is how we pack archery equipment. And the next couple topics are uh, topics where you're gonna see um, some differences between outfitters. And over the years, we've actually adjusted how we, how we pack archery equipment. But this is how I, I, I see us packing it for the foreseeable future. We've kind of tuned it uh, where this tends to work uh, best in terms of keeping people comfortable during the ride and keeping, keeping the, the bows and arrows uh, safe, okay? So what we use is we actually use these old military panniers and they're, and they're, they're a deep pannier, so they work, they work perfect with uh, the longer bow cases. And so you're gonna see us pull those out uh, during archery season. And then there's a couple different types of bow cases that you're gonna see. Um, you're gonna see uh, ones that are shaped like this that have the profile of your, of your bow. One of the cases we like the best is there's actually a Matthews case that is pretty slim, but it's rectangular shaped. And that rectangular shape is a little bit easier for us to pack on mules, you know, and, and, they're, and they're great cases, but it's another, another option for you and it does work, all right? But these are the most common uh, types of cases that we see. This is just a cheapo Charlie Plano case, Walmart carries them. Um, other places, and then this is a higher end case that has a little more, little more protection for your bow, but we can pack either one. This case is gonna be a little bit heavier. It's not, it's not the end of the world uh, than this case. <clears throat> but if you can, again, it's just a, it's an ideal scenario. If, you ha if, if people in your drop camp group, if they have identical cases, that's perfect because we can, we can pack them a little bit easier if they're, if they're similar types of cases. So when you're doing your planning, if you've got multiple types of uh, cases, if you could do us a favor and kind of match them up um, within the group, that would be, that'd be a huge help, okay? Not a necessity, but uh, it, it does help us out a little bit, all right? So Jimmy's gonna come over here and I'll show you just how these are, how these are slipped into panniers. Basically like this, it's not, it's not brain surgery. But what, what happens 
on these loads is that they're, they're a little awkward because they're so high. So a lot of times um, this will be the only thing that we pack on that mule. We might, we might put a little extra gear in there or whatever that, that fits, fits perfectly, but we keep these loads relatively light and we tend to pack them um, on our older mules. Um, and uh, we find that, that that's the best way to, to do it. One last thing on, uh, on bows, guys, is your tools, your broadheads, your releases. Most people will put them in these cases, and that's perfect because the cases are going to be left, left up at camp. Where, where sometimes this doesn't apply, I see, is that if guys are shooting long bows or recurves, a lot of times they'll have their, uh, their arrows separate, and that's fine, but they need to be very secure, okay? They can't be wrapped up in like a, you know, in a, in a soft material. Ideally, they're in like a capped PVC tube or an arrow tube where those broadheads are in, you know, in the very odd scenario that, you know, that we have, you know, we have some gear come off a mule or something. I can't have exposed broadheads. So it's very important that that, that, that stuff's in a secured location. And like I said, generally the compound bow, bow guys keep, keep uh, all their gear in these cases and that's perfect. And then all your recurve and longbow guys, even your bow too, like a lot of guys will have that just in a soft fabric. If you can find a way to put those in a PVC tube or something that's a little more, uh, a little safer and secure, that's ideal. But broadheads in particular, they have to be in something hard so they don't pose a risk uh, to, the, uh, to the pack animals and the packers. All right guys, so a quick side note um, that can help us out a lot. And that's in all these different packing scenarios, coolers, normal gear, archery equipment. One thing that we want to do is we want to, we want to minimize how noisy your gear is. And, it, and if it's, it's something that a lot of people don't, don't think about. But let's say that you've got your, your archery tools and broadheads and stuff packed separately uh, in your gear. You don't, you don't want this where here, you can hear that rattling. You got to remember that the, all this gear is getting packed on, on mules and horses and it's gonna be constant, constant bumping, right? So one, one thing to think about is that anytime there's a lot of noise, it means whatever in there is moving around, there's, you know, you're getting some rubbing on it, so that might not be good for what it is, but a lot of times that noise, it may not annoy the mule that it's packed on. Uh, you know, our mules are exposed to a lot over their lifetime, but it can, it can make you know, a riding horse that's behind that mule or another mule that's in the string nervous because they can hear that rattling the whole time. And that can, that can be a challenge uh, during a ride. And a lot of times what we have to do is we're not gonna know that till we're already on the trail. And it means that we're gonna have to stop, unpack that mule, figure out what's rattling, you know, wrap it in something soft and get rid of that noise so, so the ride goes smoothly. So if you've got loose items, even, even wrapping them in paper towels where you, where you stop that movement will help us out a lot. <clears throat> and that's, it's common in coolers too because they're hard so little items can, can, uh, can make, do some movement. And then anything like your personal items, I've had guys that have um, you know, electric toothbrushes and all of a sudden they start to go off and sometimes they won't start going off until we're an hour into the ride. But that buzzing sound can drive a, a, a totally broke general mule crazy. So just keep that in mind. If you guys can be a little conscious of that stuff uh, when you pack, it can help us out a lot on the trail. All right, so on fishing gear, guys, for drop camps and our uh, guided wilderness hunts, um, there's, there's good fishing near a lot of these camps. Typically, it's, it's small brook trout, and there are some, some cutthroat areas. The, the best thing to do is when you think about fishing gear, if it's a four or five person group, um, you probably don't need five or six fishing poles, okay? Or, or I guess what I'm saying is not everybody needs a fishing pole and, pole and gear. Uh, between hunting and everything else going on on camp, you know, you'll, you'll probably get some time to go fishing, but it's probably not going to be a huge component of your, of your hunt, all right? So keep that in mind when you're packing. You're not going to need a lot of fishing gear. The, and the ideal, um, the ideal setup for a fly rod is something like this. This is, this is what we use for our gear, and that length is about, about perfect. You're basically looking at like a 26 to 28 inch packed length. Um, that's easy for us to pack on the mules. We can't pack you know, full, full length uh, fly rod by any means, and even the ones that only, you know, only go half their length, again, those are gonna be hard to pack, all right? And whenever they're longer, they're more susceptible to getting damaged on the trail too, okay? So that's the perfect fly rod set up there. And then for you, uh, 
you spin fishermen like myself, um, these little uh, these little mini spins are perfect. You can put a couple spinners in there. Your your rod end reel is all in this little compact compartment, and those are perfect for packing on mules. All right, guys. So I'm going to go over uh, scabbards real quick and how we how we're going to pack your rifles. It, we have another uh, YouTube video on the True Hunts uh, channel that's going to cover this in a little more detail on the horses, but I wanted to mention it in the, in the packing video as, it, as it's obviously related. So there's two type of scabbards we use, these, these slimmer leather ones, and then these, uh, these uh, newer version ones that are they're full length and they're, they're a synthetic material and they're a lot, lot bulkier. So whenever you guys arrive, we see your rifles, we'll know if they're gonna fit comfortably in these leather scabbards or if they're better in these uh, long bulky scabbards. And what I would say is don't be turned off of the leather scabbards just because the butt of your rifle hangs out of them. On long rides, you're gonna, you're gonna be a lot more comfortable uh, with these scabbards if your scope and rifle will fit in them. Um, so uh, this is the ideal situation. Don't feel bad by any means if we put your rifle in that. You're actually better off than the guys that are gonna have to deal with the bulkier bulkier scabbard and both both scabbards protect your gun uh, equally equally well so just as a uh, a word of caution on these on these uh, rifles a lot of them we're gonna well all of them we're gonna have to remove the uh, bipod so if you've got a Harris bipod that's a little trickier to or not trickier but takes a little more time for us to remove it's ideal if, if when you show up you've already taken off the bipod and then you might as well, on a Harris setup, you might as well take the sling off too so it's not just, just dangling off. And then just pack that, uh, that in your gear. Um, it's, if you forget, it's not a big deal. We'll do the same thing uh, here when you arrive. The bipod's for sure gonna have to take off, or be taken off. On these other uh, bipods, like a hatch or others that, that uh, attach via a pick rail, um, they're of course a lot easier. You can just pull those off. And in that case, where the bipod doesn't use the, uh, the sling uh, attachment, you're more than welcome to leave the sling on your rifle. It's not a big deal for us to just compact this against the rifle and put it into the scabbard. All right, so that's how we're gonna pack your rifles. Forgot to mention guys, for bigger groups like five or six uh, hunters in a, in a guided camp or a drop camp that are together, a lot of times uh, guys will ask me if it's okay if they bring an extra backup rifle. Uh, that's not a problem. Um, you know, it's up to you. We can always pack. We can always keep it into the truck here at the. You can always keep it here at the ranch in your truck, locked away and safe, and we'll pack it in if you need it. But if you want it in camp for the bigger groups, we're okay doing that. Generally, what we're going to do is we're going to scabbard it the same way uh, as uh, as I mentioned before. One of these two scabbards, and then one of the guides or packers is going to is going to bring it up. The, the key thing on that is if we do do that, just remember when you get in camp, because it can be three, four hours later, uh, you need to remind the packer or wrangler to, to get that rifle out and leave it with you in camp. All right, guys, so we figured it'd be helpful or, or interesting to you guys to see how we're actually going to pack the gear uh, on, on the mules and horses. So we have different, a couple different setups here. This is a sawbuck. We use this on a lot of our horses, a, a couple of the mules, and then on... The mule back there, Theo, you can probably see a Decker setup, okay? So you'll, those are two different types of pack saddles that, that we utilize. So we're gonna show you how we do it. Um, it's basic and has a lot of utility in terms of the, the style that we use while packing. Essentially, we use a, bo a box hitch on panniers. And I'm just, I'm just waiting for all the YouTube comments on any other packing video. I get a ton of comments about how there's a better way to do it and, and a bunch of, of uh, input on, in that regard. So feel free to comment on the YouTube video so I can, I can ignore it. But uh, anyway, so Jimmy's gonna jump in here and we're gonna show you how we do it. First thing we're gonna do is we're gonna get the, the panniards on the sides that we want. And you'll see that, that uh, we actually uh, will try, like when we know we're going uphill, we're gonna try to keep the heavier end of the panniard forward and then the inverse when we're going downhill. So. First, we're gonna do this side. Jimmy's on the on side, kind of the working side of the mule. He's tightening up the cinch before we put a pannier on. I'm gonna throw this up to him. He's gonna tell me that it's on, and then while he's picking up the other pannier, I'm gonna I'm gonna keep a little uh, resistance on this side so the saddle doesn't doesn't roll at all. 
you're on. Okay, so pretty simple to get those on there. We're gonna give it a quick check. We're gonna pull out our pigtail that we string our mules together with. And then I'm looking in the back to make sure that the bars of our panniers and the bottoms are pretty, pretty close. As I mentioned before, the weight's important in terms of keeping that perfect when you're packing, but also where that center of gravity on the packs matters too, okay? So we're gonna adjust that. Jimmy made a little adjustment over here. This bar was a little bit low, all right? So <clears throat> once we have those perfect, we're gonna put our top pack on. These longer, like packs that are like this, that are a little bit longer, the way I like to do it, is put it, put it perpendicular to the mule. And saw bucks can be a little tricky because they sit up. This, this top pack kind of sits on there just right between, between the, the bucks. So we're gonna be able to suck that down good. Um, on some top packs, that saw buck pushes it up and it's a little tricky. And so those will, will end up packing on deckers a lot just because the actual buck component of the saddle has a lower, lower profile, all right? And so Jimmy gave that a check to make sure that the top pack centered on the animal. And once it is, we're gonna go ahead and cover your gear with a canvas um, that's been, that's been uh, you know, treated with water resistant stuff so your gear doesn't get wet. It also just keeps all the gear together in case there's a little activity, a mule gets spooked or something, this can, just contains the gear. And then what we do is we tuck the cover around and then we tuck it here where you can see see the bucks and that's that's a point of people have different opinions about that because when you do tuck the the cover which is meant to be partly uh, water waterproofing to the gear and the whole whole setup when you tuck it behind a saw buck there is an entry point uh, for a little a little uh, rain or whatever okay so that's the downside but I like tucking the the uh, cover behind the the buck on a decker or, or on a saw buck because I can look back across a string of mules and I can immediately see if a saddle is moving at all, right? If you're periodically checking and all you focus on is the, is the bucks, okay? You can, you can have a really quick picture of what's going on with your, with your string. If you're always focusing on how the packs look, you can kind of convince yourself that something's rolling when it's not because you're always gonna be looking at those packs from a different angle. But if you look down your string, down the, down the mains and the back of the mules and you see your bucks are staying in the same spot, then you're, you're good, your, your loads aren't, aren't shifting, okay? So that's why I prefer to have the bucks exposed. So here's what I'm talking about in terms of an exposed buck, you can see it there. And you can see that this top pack sitting up real high and bulky, but you're gonna see when we snug it down, it, comp it compresses real nice and, and stays low. You don't want top packs that stay up way high and get your mule center of gravity way, way up there where they've got to fight it the whole, uh, the whole time they're on the trail, all right? All right, so now we're gonna show you the, the knot that we use and, uh, and Jimmy's gonna start it on the, on the working side. All right, so I'm gonna start the hitch on the working side of the mule and how I'm gonna do that is I'm gonna first hand the cinch on the rope to Jimmy. I'm gonna make sure that my rope's across the top pack dead center and he's gonna hand me the cinch underneath, underneath the mule, okay? So here I've got the, the pack cinch. I'm always gonna have the hook going back, all right? And that's because we need a bunch of, we need it to be aerodynamic so the mule goes faster. Nah, just kidding. Actually what it is, is there's just a little less risk. If that hook's forward, there's, there's more risk that something gets in there and pops, pops that, that rope out. So we just, as a habit, we put that, uh, that pack cinch back. Uh, facing backwards in terms of the hook. All right, so here I'm just gonna try to center the cinch on the animal and I can do that by manipulating the rope here and the, the tightening part, the, the tag end of the rope. So I'm keeping that all straight. Jimmy's gonna communicate what it looks like on his end. I'm gonna ask him, how does it look, Jimmy? You can take it. So I can pull the cinch my way a little bit. And then the main thing is what we're looking for is I'm gonna ask Jimmy to make sure the ring's not on the flesh of the mule. How's it look, Jimmy? We're good. Okay, so then I'm gonna snug it up. And on all, on, on different mules, it's gonna, be, it's gonna be different where this hook ends up, okay? This is a smaller mule, so what's gonna happen is the hook is, is right up here against the pannier. A lot of times you're gonna be off your gear down here. 
and it really, it really doesn't matter. I mean, some guys always want it floating down here, but I found over probably thousands of loads, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't make a whole lot of difference, okay? So what I do, and some people are mixed on this, but what I do is here to hold the load, I do just one little half hitch over, over the hook. And if you're doing, it, doing this hitch with another guy, it's not a big deal to not do that. It's probably slightly safer in terms of getting yourself out of a jam if you don't. But if you're packing one by yourself, you've got to do that just to keep, keep the tension there where you're not going to lose all that, all that tension as you do the, uh, the other side of the knot. Rope. So I'm telling Jimmy, here comes the rope. He's going to pull it over there. And then while he does the box hitch on that side, um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to hold, hold tension here. All right, all right, guys. So me and Jimmy swapped real quick, so I could I could show you the the, the start of the actual knot. And people kind of overcomplicate this. Really, what it is, you're half hitching the load on each side. Okay, once you get that that pack cinch over there and uh, snugged up, I'm gonna half hitch this side, and then I'm gonna give the rope to Jimmy, and he's gonna half hitch and tie off that side. All right. So basically, here, take my hand like this, roll it. Okay, grab this end here. So the 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 end of my rope is going through the loop, okay? And then here, this is my tight end, right? So that's the end that I'm gonna work on. I'm gonna, on, a, on a top pack like this, I want my, I want this, this T right here to be on top of the top pack so I can pull pressure down on the load. So I'm gonna go here, I'm gonna go around the pannier. On different loads, you guys will go behind the bars of the pannier. That's the bar that's on the top of the pannier. It just varies. Sometimes it's ideal to go behind them. Sometimes it's ideal to go in front of them. Just depends on the bulk and weight of the load. But one of the keys is if you really want the load to ride well is you want to do it the same on each, on both sides. So in this case, I'm going in front of the bars. So I'm going to go down here. I'm holding, te holding tension. I'm going to go here. You can see the bar right here. Okay. I'm going to pull this up and then I'm going to grab my slack here and then with a big bulky pack or a big uh, bulky top uh, load like that, top pack, I'm gonna make sure I snug it down here first to pull that down. You can see I'm pulling a lot of that, a lot of that uh, mass out of the top of the top pack. And then here, I've I've got my tail end of my rope, and now I've got <clears throat> I'm holding all the tension here. Okay, one of the keys of this hitch and what makes it nice is that you can pull you can pull the pannier in the load off of the off of the mule a little bit and that helps a lot like diamonds and other hitches those are they're very applicable to a lot of scenarios some scenarios they're they're slightly better in this hitch but one thing that most of them don't do <clears throat> is they don't do what i just said they actually tend to compress the load down on the animal so if you don't got big pack pads or you've just got different shaped animals sometimes that uh, that gear can can rub on them a little bit okay so i just do this i've got the load i just pick it up a smidge okay if i got somebody that's looking they can look for me they can see that there's a little space between here but generally you can feel that right so i'm going to pull that up just a little bit get it snugged up a little bit and then i'm going to send the rope jimmy's way rope all right so now we're going to finish off the uh the box hitch okay so i've got it here you can see if you're looking at the top pack of the mule one side is compressed this side's still pretty bulky so here same deal looking at the the back of my hand okay with the rope and i just spin it okay there's my loop this loop here is going to go over the the pack okay and then the tail end of my rope is going down the center line all right so again i've got a kind of a a work inside of the rope that I'm pulling tension. I'm putting that knot up here on the top pack so I can work that down as I go. Here I went in front of the bars like I did on that side. Okay, going down through here, around the pannier, here in front of the, the bar up here. You know, a lot of guys will, won't pull tension here it's hard to get it once you're down at the end of the knot. So I find that if you need to really compress a top pack, you need to, you need to pull some of that out while you're up there, okay? And you've got the, the angle on it, all right? Okay, so then I come down to the end here. Again, I'm gonna snug it up, okay? And lift it up a little bit off the mule's shoulder and the side of the, uh, the, the, uh, the saw buck. 
And the thing is, on the second side that you do it on, you don't want to pull too hard and get crazy about it, because when you do that, it has a tendency to, to suck the other side back into the animal. So it's really ideal if you got somebody behind you and you, they can kind of see you even up those loads, okay? All right, guys, and then to finish off the knot, we're just gonna come up here with the tail of our rope, and we're gonna do what's called a packer's knot. So we're gonna go take a bite of the rope over that side of the, the box hitch, okay? Then we're gonna go over the other side of the box hitch with the bite, and then pull it through the middle of the bite, okay? And so you've got a loop there, and then what you wanna do is just a simple half hitch over the top, okay? In this case, the rope is just the perfect length where you don't have a bunch of extra material. If you do, you can just daisy chain it, okay? Daisy chain that rope through and then half edge the end and then tuck that daisy chain <clears throat> somewhere that's not gonna get caught on brush and that sort of thing, okay? So that's your finishing knot and that's, uh, that's uh, box hitch loads. All right guys, so there's a packed up load uh, ready for the mountains and uh, most of you guys that are coming in groups of four or five, you're gonna see that we pack up, you know, four or five of those loads, maybe six, we'll throw in an extra one for you. But anyways, that's what it looks like. And at this point, we'll get you on the riding horses and we head up the trail.